And welcome to another episode of Terms Defined here. And this one is going to be a, a very ethereal Terms Defined as we're going to define whatever terms we happen to stumble upon as we're talking about all kinds of things, whether it's uh, electric universes, solar minimums, electricity itself, cosmology, astrophysics, possibly into some stuff like subatomic physics and so on. Welcome Eugene Bagashov to another edition of Terms Defined. How goes it? Hello, everyone. Yeah, hello, Daniel. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, always interesting. So um, perhaps first we should start talking about uh, the term electric itself, right? So what, since you're, you know, you're a theoretical particle physicist, uh, PhD candidate, um, what are your thoughts on the definition of the term electric, whether it's, whether it's defining what makes a hairdryer electric or what makes um, stuff like the Earth's ionosphere electric? Well, it's actually a very hard term to define, and I guess there may be different readings, so to speak, on what you consider electric. But, I mean, in general, in, in physics, whatever uh, possesses, let's say, electric fields may be called electric. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, currently, as you probably know, in physics, there oh, are... Oh, currently, be... that's, a, I see the pun there. <laughs> currently, I get it. <laughs> Good yeah, one. Yeah, well, Good that, one. that wasn't a pun, actually, but anyway, oh, there are four <laughs> fundamental interactions, well, actually kind of five if you count the Higgs, but whatever. So, electromagnetic, gravitation, weak and strong, right? Right. Nuclear ones. So, electromagnetic interaction, pretty much... Is, is the thing. I mean, there's electricity and magnetism, so I guess what you call electric is this electricity part of electromagnetism. But but again, you may uh, invent whatever terms you like, and you, you, you may more or less be, let's say, liberal with this term electric. So Sure, sure. Although, I mean, when people say electric universe, uh, that's actually a, a co copyrighted, you know, a trademark by the Thunderbolts guys. So. Oh, I see. Well, in, but in any case, I, I don't know. I guess I guess I kind of got nerdy about this when it when it came to uh, astronomy in the mid '90s. That's when I took an astronomy class in college, and I noticed some of the some of the theories that were going on in astronomy class. And they were gen the ones that weren't sort of what you call the mainstream theories were sort of not talked about too much because people were concerned about what would be on the test because they were essentially taking astronomy as an elective. But some of mm -hmm. us, some of us real astronomy nerds, started asking questions that caused conversations that took a whole class and got people very angry, and <laughs> because it had nothing to do with the test. We wanted to know how the stuff really works. So, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, when I see a new invention and stuff. If I go, how could it possibly do that? I want to know what the physics is behind it. And so, of course, I want to know how the physics is on things like how cosmology works. And the more we look at it, the more disparities we've seen. By the way, just as a little side note, we should get back to electricity and, and electric universe and so on. But have you seen this new story about this gamma ray pulsar? There's a, a, a pulsar, which we only see in gamma ray spectra. We don't see it. No, I, I haven't seen it. It doesn't show up in X-ray or UV or visible light or radio or microwave or anything like that. It only shows up in, in gamma ray spectra. And mm. it, it appears to be to a, a massive star orbited by a less massive star at 1.3 lunar distances. So it's only about you know 30% farther away from the other star than the Earth is from the moon. And it, mm, that's kind of hard to believe, to be honest. And it allegedly does the orbit in 70 minutes, which puts it at 700 kilometers per second. Faster than uh, most fast solar wind speeds. Yeah. So, but it's, I, I, I'm not suggesting that it's wrong, but uh, it's, I would say there'd be some interesting tidal forces associated. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that kind of seems doubtful to me at least. It's believed to be a, uh, there's like a sphere of plasma around it that's so dense that it seems to block all the other wavelengths of light. That's the theory behind mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's interesting, but 
in any case, back to back to sort of the electric universe, the more uh, I guess normal stuff. Um, yeah, so you know, I wouldn't refute the fact that certainly things like the Earth's weather and sort of the Earth's relationship with the sun in a lot of ways, for instance, if a coronal mass ejection strikes the magnetosphere really hard, those relationships are kind of electric in a lot of ways mm -hmm. in that you're injecting massively powerfully charged materials into the less charged materials. So you've got electrons are get yanked away from whatever molecules they're on and so on. And that is a fundamentally elect electric reaction. But when you look at stars, how they interact with each other, you don't really see this. And so this is, this is one of the problems with, uh, with a lot of the ideas about stars themselves being electric. I, I don't see, and I've been looking for it for, for a few years now, and I, I don't see evidence that stars are fundamentally electric in terms of how their composition, um, how their composition contributes to the way they appear when we look at them. Yeah, well, I mean, the main issue here really is the amount of electricity, so to speak, that you need to produce this huge amount of energy that the star is emitting. So that's the, 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 the most fundamental, well, probably not the most fundamental, but, but a serious issue. But a fundamental issue is like uh where are these this electricity where is the where is it coming from basically so it's, right, it's right. another good question like um some people had ideas like uh, there there are like currents between the stars which sounds kind of stupid because well if let's say all the stars act as well hypothetically let's say anodes or whatever yeah no um, i mean I, I don't think i don't how, think that how sounds there be a current between two different stars they're both anodes yeah so. yeah exactly yeah kind of yeah like I, I i agree with you there like that that is one of the fundamental problems with what people refer to as the electric universe that's that's a huge deal like we i don't see evidence when you look at cosmological scale structures in galactic scale and even stellar scale stuff, you don't really see these Birkeland currents that need to exist uh, at a huge scale. Every place where there's a, quote, star forming region, end quote, to use sort of like a mainstream cosmology term. And I don't know how many, how many, de how many layers deep are we in terms that we're using here now at this point? We're like, <laughs> it's like, is this mainstream cosmology? Is this, uh, are we talking electric universe? But, mm -hmm. but anyway, we, we don't, in other words, if one of, the, one of the biggest issues with the idea that stars form via Markland convection is that when we would see, when we would look at uh, large scale jets in, in galaxies especially, we should see a series of molecularly separated shells, almost like a, almost like a cyclotron, not like a cyclotron. Like a, like a centrifuge. You should see almost like a centrifuge, but in reverse because of the Markland convection. But we really don't particularly see that. So while I think while that is happening definitely on the surface of stars, um, I don't see that happening on large scales or at great distances. And I think it has to do with the fact that, there, that um, there's... Where, where are all the electrons coming from? That's, I think that's the real question. And it, it makes the universe look el less electric to me than it does electric. I would actually disagree with you. I think uh, it's exactly the, the reverse. We can observe Markland convection in these large-scale plasma filaments, but we don't really see it at stars. That's what I would say. But then and why, why would... Why wouldn't we see shells of uh, of separated elements in those in those jets? We don't really see that. We see almost entirely hydrogen. Uh, well, it means that there's almost entirely hydrogen <laughs> and much less of heavier elements. That that's basically the, the answer. Uh, but if there were other elements, and you see, I, I would also disagree with the statement that we should see like 
separated shells uh, because Markland convection is not a quantized you know process it doesn't require stuff to be separated it just says that uh, it we'll say at larger distances separate. there would be a higher concentration of a certain element and and at smaller distances it would be lower that that's basically the point so it's not a like a step like you know function it's more more of a continuum I see what you're saying. Yeah, but I mean, if, um, if if stars form that way, you should still see some evidence of it. So when you see, like what like what I said about really large jets, when you look at galactic scale ones, you should see chemical separations in those jets. You should see essentially concentric circles on those poloidal jet fields. No. Um, well, sort of, probably, but again, I, I, I'm I'm. Uh, not a specialist in this area, so I cannot really tell you uh, right, what right, the exact right. observables are, but I'm pretty sure we can see stars of different chemical compositions of different generations, you know, as they say. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't refute the so, fact that it looks like stars are making heavier elements, um, you know, and, and one of the major arguments in cosmology and maybe people who haven't seen the channel or anything like that before are not aware of this, but, you know, part, part of the way that we sort of determine how old we think a star is and all that has to do with the HR diagram and what, what we see on the spectra and what we see mm -hmm. in terms of the, di the, uh, the diameter of the star from, from where we're viewing yes. it. And, of course, this, this can be skewed be for various reasons. For instance, if we're looking at the pole of the star – It'll look much brighter than if we're looking at the equator of the star. and But besides that, whatever emission spectra that it has, it could look blue, it could look red, and so on. The The theories as to why it looks blue, why it looks red, and why the diameter is, is such as it is, is a function of, in, in sort of what you would call, what would you call it, the standard model, right? The standard model of cosmology would be that the reason the spectra are as they are uh, is essentially just a function of the mass and a function of the chemical components of the second generation system if it formed in one, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's, a, if it's a generation one star, it's basically just a function of the mass. And if it's a generation two star, like we believe the sun to be in terms of the standard cosmological model, it's just sort of a combination of which elements we have and how much how much of them. Essentially, it's just like it's basically like just a chemical equation. Yeah, but I mean, all those theories are basically like guesses. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just because I'm just trying to explain the standard model because you got to have something on which to base the discussion because you're, you're you're looking at some pretty ethereal subjects here, right? you got to ask mm -hmm. yourself what you're measuring, right? Yeah, like we do not actually evidence the, the, the birth of a star, etc. So we, we do not really know how it happens. Or the death of a star. Happens. Well, we see like sort of a death of a star in, in terms of like supernovae, etc. But they stop, um, they stop emitting light, but then a lot of times they start emitting light. You know, you ever notice that? There's a bunch of, there's a whole lot of articles about it. So it's... We see supernova shells, but we tend to see them with a star in the center of them a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, that's also fair. So, I mean, so again, there, there are too many unknowns, unfortunately, and we cannot really yeah. tell. But with regards to, say, things like Markland convection, it's actually fairly simple. I mean, it's just a, a E cross B drift in a plasma filament. So if you have an electric field, let's say, that drives this current, whatever it is, uh, and if you have a temperature gradient, a radial temperature gradient in, in this current, so let's say a center of the current is hotter than the edges or vice versa, it doesn't really matter, uh, then it would mean that the... It would, it would be like having a lower relative pressure in the center of it, so th things would want to things would want to no, gravi gravitate... No, it's not about the pressure. Uh, it's about the E cross B drift again. So it's a plasma process. If you have a, an electric field and a magnetic field which is not parallel to it, but you know at a, at a slight angle, 
then the plasma would tend to drift like one way or the other perpendicular to, to this to the plane where, where those fields are. And this fundamentally is what causes Markland convection. Right, that's that's and the that's the like, Hall like, effect at at work, right? The Hall effect essentially. Uh, well, sort of, kind of, but again, E cross B drift, uh, you can you can find that easily. It's a very known plasma phenomenon. So this causes Markland convection, and because um, in such a drift, like um, you see, with this temperature gradient, you have certain areas where certain elements are thermally ionized. Uh, because they have lower ionization potential, and other elements are not ionized yet because, it, I mean, the temperature isn't enough. Or sure, least there's sure. less of these elements ionized, right? Right, right. Uh, so, which, which would mean that at certain distances, some elements begin to drift because they are ionized, so they are subject to the C. Crosby drift, and other elements aren't. So this basically is, is the mechanism how the, this structurizing works let's, let's right right i get that i get that and for instance if you wanted to accelerate all of those forces if you blasted an electron beam at them what would happen it would accelerate the forces correct mm, what do you mean by accelerate the forces i mean it like so you know the the speed and, and force at which these things occur if you if you fire electron if you put an anode and a cathode around this sort of theoretical situation you're talking about where marking convection is happening if you increase the electron content of the area doesn't that sort of speed things up in terms of reaching their ultimate conclusion well i don't know i mean firstly you require an external electric field that would drive this current in the first place so you already kind of have an anode and a cathode somewhere along this axis uh but I'm not sure, like, if you add electrons, well, certainly electrons would also be subject to those forces. So maybe more ions would recombine, so actually there would be less separation, at least for certain elements, etc. So it's it's a very complex question. I mean, where would you get those electrons from? Well, I mean, I don't I, know. and I, you know, I think that, but, I think that's sort of a, that's sort of a good uh, a good transition into into things that are a lot closer to home here, like the Earth's geomagnetic field. Mm -hmm. You know, what? Why are all those electrons out there? Mm, what do you mean? Like there's there are electrons and ions in the magnetosphere. Let's say, like the Van Allen, uh, like and for for instance, the yeah, the Van it's, Allen. it's full of electrons and protons. Like the inner belt is mostly protons, the outer belt is mostly electrons. Well, not, not mostly, but let's say there is more electrons than there are protons. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've got multiple, you've got multiple different plasma spheres there. You've got, you've got different different energy states of, of those electron fluxes on the different shells. So you you know depend if there's mm -hmm. a if there's a, if there's a lot of pressure on the magnetosphere, you may have two or three or four or six shells or something like that. But yeah, on, no, on the, not really. On I the mean, inner as far outer, as we know, there are only like three belts. Uh, like two belts exist more or less always, and the third appears during these serious perturbations. Well, I'm well not, as far as I know, I'm not. Anyway. I'm not. I'm not really sure. I haven't. I haven't really looked, read a whole lot about that. But I figured there would probably be. You would see multiple belts forming. Who knows how many? But it it all really depends on the resolution of your measurement. Which sort of, I think that maybe that's a transition to, to yet another thing, because with a lot of the stuff that we're talking about often on here, whether you're talking about things like the cosmic microwave background, which we haven't even brought into this yet regarding cosmology, mm -hmm. or the Big Bang or anything like that, we're talking about more sort of, I guess, physically measurable stuff. Um, I think that's, that's sort of a, a very interesting topic, too. Well, let's talk about it then. What do you have on your mind? I completely lost train of thought. I have no idea what I. I have absolutely nothing on my well, mind. I thought I thought you were gonna. <laughs> I thought you were gonna jump in. <laughs> well, there are many theories about cosmic microwave background. There's a, like a Big Bang cosmologist's version that it's a 
basically um, emission of these, basically the result of the um, recombination process in the early universe, you know, when basically early universe consisted of charged particles and when these charged particles kind of formed at neutral atoms, so they combined, they emitted uh, photons and these photons initially were very high energy because, well, everything was very hot, etc., etc. But then as the universe expanded, uh, these photons also be, be, became kind of stretched out, so their wavelength increased, so their energy decreased, and now it's super low, like in microwave range, whereas initially it was like super high energy gamma, etc. It's tired so this light. Is the base. Tired light, essentially. No, it's not tired light. It's a standard Big Bang cosmology. Uh, oh, all right. So yeah, that, that would be that would be a, a description of something different. All right, my bad, my bad. Yes, you're talking about cosmological redshifts, which is a completely different uh, subject. But but they are related because so, they're still photons, so it still is. Yes. All right. Anyway. So this is a standard idea, and then there are alternative theories, such as, again, the most famous probably is the Robitaille's uh, idea that uh, these microwaves are actually emitted by water uh, on Earth, I mean, and not uh, by uh, the universe itself. Polar and there are some molecules. solid arguments uh, in favor of this idea, such as that, well, there are many arguments, like, in the first place, Big Bang, Big Bang cosmology doesn't really work. So, I mean, physically, it's just rubbish. So, you can't. <laughs> that's already a good argument that you need an alternative explanation. Then there's a, an idea of uh, Eddington, out of all people, uh, who, well, it's not actually the idea about the cosmic microwave background, but still, he calculated sometime in early 20th century, like, I don't exactly remember, like 1910, maybe something like that. So he calculated that the uh, temperature, like if you take the starlight from all the universe, uh, like what would it look like? Like the, the sum of, of the light of, of all stars combined. Right? There'd be a lot of spectra, uh, what, I would what, say, a lot what, of spectra. <laughs> what properties would it have? So he calculated it, this light to have a temperature of around three Kelvin which is almost equal to the temperature of the cosmic microwave background, which is 2.7. So, but, well, it kind of looks cool on the surface, but unfortunately, I think the spectrum would actually uh, be very different. Uh, like, um, I'm not, not exactly sure, I haven't researched this uh, particular statement, but I think the it's a different kind of temperature we're talking about. You know, there are lots of different temperatures. There's like a yep. Um, and now we're into brightness, what brightness temperature. There is a like right, whatever. right, right, right. So, and now we're into what are you measuring, right? And <laughs> and for instance, this is a this is one of the great Robitaille arguments because there are various thermodynamic arguments about uh, you know the standard model of stars why black holes can't do what they do, they do work on themselves. And there are thermodynamically fraught features of the alleged universe. Uh, and because in order to measure the temperature of something, you have to know what the pressure is. If it's in a, quote, vacuum, how are you going to measure the temperature of a molecule in space when it is, quote, in a vacuum? So, you know, th this is a, and this is a constant thing uh, because, once again, you're into the realm of, when, when a radio telescope or even an X-ray telescope looks at something, you have to ask yourself what it is you're looking at. And there's a, there's a lot of odd presumptions going on. It's, it's, a, it's a little horrifying because I read uh, astronomy cosmology articles daily. And I say, okay, the headline says this. And then I read the article and I say, okay, the study was this. And then I start biting my nails and I go, they were measuring this allegedly, and then, and then I go, this is how they think they were measuring that, and then I go, oh my god, it's LIGO. It's, we've, we've gotten into LIGO territory. <laughs> yeah, well, modern philosopher of science, 
and just in general philosopher Bruno Latour, who I reference a lot in my videos, for example, uh, he talks about the, what he calls the translation, ah, uh, which yeah, means like, uh, you know, sort of kind of having one device and measuring something uh, and then inferring from that measurement something else. He calls this the translation. So yeah. you're saying you're measuring this, but you're actually measuring something else. And nobody even guarantees that you're properly measuring this thing in the first place that yeah. you're measuring. Yeah. You know? garbage because there's, is garbage again, a yeah. whole array of theories behind how your device works and a whole right. bunch of assumptions connected yeah. to that and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, and this whole process of like, let's say abstractly giving voice to this whatever thing you're trying to imply uh, through your measurement right here made with all those theories is, is what he calls translation. So, right. I and he yeah. claims that, you know, basically it's, it's a very kind of um, potentially flawed process in the first place or actually like fundamentally flawed all the time. <laughs> somewhere between there. It's It's got to be somewhere between there. It couldn't possibly be right because you could have two photometers a millimeter away from each other and they're not going to measure the same thing. You could shine a laser across them and they're going to constantly have some fluctuation based on all kinds of things. The Earth's magnetic field, cosmic ray flux, UV light, and all a million things. Just the thermal processes going on in the room will mess with it. Uh, yeah, and you know that um, we don't even know like uh, if, if the radius of Earth is constant, let's say. So uh, if it increases, and uh, I've actually read some papers and it, <clears throat> it is implied currently that, uh, well, basically the, the measurement is within the error bars. So we don't know if it's, if it's correct, but the rate at which the Earth may be expanding currently seems to be around one millimeter per year. Or about so so that's creepy. Real, it's slowly exploding <laughs> beneath our feet. Yeah, but <laughs> yes, but what I mean, I mean, if you look at, at LIGO data, what they need to measure is like fraction of the diameter of proton type of change. And if you have a millimeter, which is how much? Let me calculate quickly. Like ten to the twentieth uh, power, larger than that. So how can you measure that on, on such an unstable Earth? You know. Uh, yeah, I, like, I agree. I agree, man. In I, the first place, like. <laughs> and this, let, you know, let's, let's, we should close things out pretty soon. And we should talk for just a moment about blasphemy in science. And, you know, just to preface this, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm trying to advance the actual science by causing people to ask themselves the correct questions that need to be asked as to what's going on in nature. Because the correct way to, to, to do science is to say, Here's what I see in nature occurring. Here's a hypothesis for how that's occurring. And then here's me doing either experiments or more observations and a combination of those two preferably and trying to come up with a more, le a more refined theory about what it is that I'm observing nature. What isn't science is having an insane theory based on math only and then cherry-picking all possible data in the entire universe to try to support that theory and then telling people that you've proven it. Well, actually, you find it kind of amusing. I mean, uh, it's, it's what, again, philosophers did always. Like, they uh, came up with some ridiculous crap, and they, and they tried to convince all the people that this crap is, you know, true. Like, it is October, but you, you may be truly evil uh, here, Eugene. I, I don't know. You, it's... You may be an evil scientist. I'm not, I'm not it's sure. A, it's actually a very, well. I'm I'm kind of a jester, you know. My personality type, like I, I like. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get that. That's so, good. That's good. I, I absolutely enjoy this type of you know occupation, like let's say inventing some crazy, ridiculous idea and then just rhetorically forcing everyone to believe it. I think it's brilliant. It's it's like. The thing you should strive for in life. <laughs> a, do, a doomsday, a doomsday device. Is that is that what you're referring to, Eugene? You you must invent a doomsday mm. device and request one billion dollars, or you're going to submerge the Earth in a pool of hot liquid magma. Is that what I'm no, getting no, from you? No, more of a that. That's too you know, kind of um, rough 
I'm more into <laughs> delicate stuff, you know, into mind games, so to speak. Because you're a philanthropist, yeah. you you want you want people to evolve by by doing things like thinking, right? Yeah, well, I actually like enjoy the attitude of let's say Greek sophists who basically have proven uh, by practice that. Uh, you know, if you get some amount of money, then you can prove anything, and you can also disprove it. <laughs> yeah. This is this is my fundamental attitude. Like, if you seriously want to prove something, you can do that. Like logic, uh, there, there's plenty of loopholes in logic which uh, allows, and in rhetoric again, uh, people should learn rhetoric. Really, it's it's again, you've probably seen this video by Lindy Beige about rhetoric. It's it's a really I might have thing. yeah. Lindy Beige is a great is a great channel. And uh, yeah, so my point is that again, you can prove anything and you can disprove anything. I think so. You can. Again. Uh, when I was talking about, I think I made this point when I was talking about this uh, solar micronova uh, idea that uh, if you cherry pick the evidence, uh, well, the color is different. I mean, it should if, be black. If you if you stayed uh, still, I could I could make a dark brown. And okay. You, what a, okay, else. What about if Hitler was mad woke? He could he could dye it purple. No, I think he'd dye his hair first of all. Well, something like that. You know. <laughs> it's That's... it's like 2007 is back, boys. <laughs> you know, emo. That's great. Whatever. <laughs> so my point is basically, yeah, you can prove anything and you can disprove anything, and it's it's beautiful in my opinion. Like, it it kind uh, of is. I mean, it's like it's people, like a wag the dog. Are, I'm sorry. It's it's like a wag the dog. You know, like yeah, sort of, sort you, of. You get that, right? Uh, everything is relative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, some people are depressed by it, like when I say that there is no truth, you know, or something like that. Uh, but I, I feel this is actually like, of course, you experience some stage of like. Uh, it creates a conflict anger, and a discomfort. Yes, anger, yes, et yes. Cetera, et cetera. But this is good that's for only you. The first stage. Yes. But later, you understand that. And by the way, this is uh, what is illustrated by works of Nietzsche, like "Thus Spake Zarathustra." Is basically the story about this, like uh, depression about the absence of truth, and then realization that you can make your own truth uh, based on your own values, not the values imposed by you. Right. Right. Uh, only by someone, etc. So. Um, of course, there are some doubts that whether you can actually create your own values. Like if you li listen to Jordan Peterson, he talks about this a lot. Like, uh, right, uh, right. Uh, you know, th there is there some fundamental values that you shouldn't like break. Uh, but I'm a little bit more open about this. I think that, well, certainly there are ways of behavior that, let's say, would destroy you or society or both, right? But. Uh, uh, other than that, there are still plenty of possibilities for, you know, production of these values, etc., and ways of living and um, things like that. But I see we came a long way from cosmology to philosophy. No, that's a good thing though, because that was kind of the point. By the way, we're we're about to create a new playlist on the channel: interviews with humans. We might not call it that, but mm -hmm. it'll, it'll be something like that. And, are you uh, sure I'm a human? Um, I'm, I don't know. I think, I'm, I think half Asians are humans. Um, uh, okay. so, you know, even, even though you're a PhD candidate, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. We'll, we'll assume, mm -hmm. we'll assume you don't believe enough lies to, <laughs> to, to be, to be an inhuman. But anyway, viewers, don't forget to subscribe to Eugene, the philosopher's channel and it's philosopher, yep. which is, With a uh, T. Yeah, P H I L O S T O P H E R, like Christopher, but Philopstopher, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, anything else to add? I mean, I think this this is this is has to, has to be a conversation that's going to be going on for a long time because I I see a whole bunch of physics and astrophysics and cosmology being rewritten, and I I'm not anti anybody's stance on it. Because mm -hmm. anything that's plausible at this point sort of makes sense. And, you know, to go back to 1994, when I started to become sort of like a, a real cosmology nerd, I knew too much about physics already before I got out of high school because I was interested in physics for real in high school. I took physics class, and we 
we uh, a couple of friends and I took over the class multiple times because we're like, what about time? What about absolute zero? What is you know? What, it, isn't it just like absolute zero? Isn't it like stopping time if you have absolute zero in a chemical, you know, a chemical situation? And you know, we would. Well, it actually kind of is. Because, it sort of um, is, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it has zero entropy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you know, well, actually, we would actually hijack. Not quite. Sort of. The entropy would. The entropy would not be defined if the temperature is zero. I get. That, I guess, yeah. but but yeah, but. As you got close, it would be so low, it would be immeasurable. So you wouldn't know because you wouldn't know what you were measuring. But <laughs> but that's, that's how we would hijack classes back then. So when I got to college astronomy, that's when I started to notice that some people were referring to what we would refer to in the standard cosmological model as supermassive black holes, as massive radio sources. And I thought to myself... Why are certain people being purists about their language and not being blasphemous and referring to certain things as massive radio sources instead of, quote, black holes, end quote? And the reason is, is because they can measure the radio waves, but they can't determine that it meets the definition of what we'd call in cosmology a black hole. Sorry, I was muted. You uh, muted? I, would, uh, I, I did not. That, uh, I did not mute this man. It was Facebook and Twitter and freaking YouTube what? did it. Uh, somebody else mute. Who muted you, Eugene? Out them. Myself. Uh -oh. no, I'm the architect of my own disaster. Th throw this man in a gulag. He's muted himself. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I would. I would. I just wanted to comment that it's the black holes is a problem of astrophysics, not cosmology. It's a difference. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I guess I guess you could say that. Yeah, for sure. Because it's math looking for phenomenon. Well, I mean, cosmology works with the universe as a whole, whereas yeah, but, astrophysics works with like smaller scale objects. Yeah. Like yeah. again, I've already mentioned that, but I'll repeat it that my teacher, my the lecturer at the university who uh, was reading us lectures on relativity, he said that. Uh, a dot, like the most basic object for cosmology, is a galaxy. So, uh, oh, I see. Everything what you're that's lo right. larger than galaxies is subject of. All cosmology. right, so so it, essentially, I'm a blasphemer because I refer to all kinds of things as cosmology that absolutely aren't cosmology. By the way, if well, you... in some sense, you may call every everything in physics cosmology because yeah, you're yeah. dealing with how cosmos works. Which it's is formed by stars or whatever, right? So, by the way, uh, before we end this, and we, we've got to soon, we're almost at an hour here, and it's 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 a, it's always a lovely convo with you. I, I love recording these because we create pressure by telling people that we're going to see them. You shouldn't have created a lot of pressure by creating this video called The Boring World. This one is so good. Everybody should watch this. So whoever's viewing mm -hmm. this video, go to Eugene the Philosopher and look at this video, The Boring World. It's about the way people will tell you Oh my God, the universe is geometry. Everything is a cube. Everything's electric. Yeah. You're, you're... And the number five <laughs> describes everything. Yeah. I can't believe it only has 149 views, man. That should have 14,000 views today. And, and by the way, it might get 148 views as a result of having us highlighted it. You may lose a view. I don't know if you're monetized. Okay. Are, are you, are you monetized? No, no. No, you cannot be monetized, I think, if you're under 1,000 subscribers and, yeah. and some amount of viewership per something. Per, per month year. or something. Yeah, I think yeah, it's per yeah. month. Yeah, yeah. It's... But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I've never had an idea to monetize the channel. Like, it's not about money anyways. It's just my, like, notebook of, of sorts. Yeah, yeah. So... It's, it, and it, it's, you, it's you may notice though. that I'm, I'm not really concerned about the quality of the videos in the first place. So, um, no, the videos, I mean, are, the videos I mean, are high if quality. If I was really committed to it, I could have, you know, studied how, how you properly edit the videos and, and do cuts, which I never do. Like, I do everything in one, you know, yeah, yeah. Cut. I try to keep my so, stuff raw, too. And by the way, the Wu Tang Clan would greatly appreciate your keep it, keeping it raw, man. So keep it raw. The mm -hmm. Wu-Tang Clan would straight up endorse you. They're, okay. they're, 
they're they're less than they're less than an hour and a half from where I live, so <laughs> I can make it to Philly well, or New York. I'm not a fan of Wu Tang Clan, but they had a pretty interesting uh, collaboration with Fugazi. Oh, really? I am a fan. Oh wow! Because yeah. I'm an I'm an old you know I started learning to skateboard in 1983, the same year I started taking mm -hmm. Taekwondo. So Fugazi, yeah, that was yeah, they, they were still that's together totally back then. Totally part of my scene, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's pretty cool. One other thing, uh, before we close it out, and we should soon, what about, oh, what's, and, what's going way, on? We're in... also in the coffee and cigarettes, obviously. Coffee and cigarettes? Uh, Jim, Jim Jarmusch, yeah. With Fug movie. Fugazi? No, Wu-Tang Clan with uh, Bill Murray in that episode. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I actually recommend you to watch it, uh, Coffee and Cigarettes. It's a series of short uh, scenes, like short video essays. Like, ske so like sketch speak. comedy kind of a thing? or Kind of, but not quite. But that sounds cool. Oh, close. by the way, have you seen the new Borat movie? The new Borat, if you have Amazon Prime, yeah. dudes. So we, we've, got, we've got Amazon Prime. I'm not advertising this like an affiliate link or anything, but the new Borat movie is absolutely hilarious. It's it's a little bit skewed toward like anti-Trump stuff, and I don't care because I I've never been affiliated with a political political party. But yo, it's funny. It's got some legit clips. Sasha Baron Cohen invades CPAC, and there were you know this is in the news when it really happened, but he invaded CPAC, the the gathering of conservatives dressed as Trump, mm -hmm. carrying his fictional fifteen year old daughter on his shoulder to give her to Mike Pence as a gift, and then he got thrown mm -hmm. out. And then there was a, a recent news story that was like really popular about Giuliani like zipping his pants up or something. And what this was was they I I and as far as I know, they made a fake interview on purpose with Giuliani as a fake Kazakhstan young woman reporter. And when when it started to get weird, Giuliani was like, "All right, I'm out of here." And he pulled his mic off, which caused his shirt to become untucked. And then he like leaned back and tucked his shirt in and they took a photo. And right at that moment, Sasha Baron Cohen bursted in the room wearing a weird like thong and like a pink fishnet like camisole mm -hmm. thing and said, and said, don't, don't do that. She's too old for you. She's 15 or something like that. And then they ran out of the room and Giuliani was like, what should I do when he called the police? But it's really in the movie. It's it's hilarious. And again, I'm not paid to say this, but it's it's so good. You could probably. Well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not into that sort of humor. Like oh it's, man, it's too silly for me. It's 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 pretty uh, good though. It's it's got a lot of poignant stuff, and you know. In terms of comedy, I'm, I'm into like uh, people like Bill Burr, for example. Like, oh, Bill Burr! Comedian. I love Bill Burr. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's just a genius. Like really. Like he just can just rant about anything and it would be very hilarious always. A, a lot um, of the whole yeah. Joe Rogan sphere, you know, there's, there's a lot of people like, like, I think, I think Joe Rogan might be right when he says, we were just talking about this yesterday with, with uh, smash staff. Um, I think Joey Diaz might be the funniest stand up ever. That guy is so freaking hilarious. And maybe it's just because I'm from the East coast of the U S or something. But did you ever hear Joey Diaz? He's no, I don't think so. He's highly endorsed. So if you like stand-ups, um, he's uh, he's sort of like a, a Cuban American. He, he's highly endorsed by people like Joe Rogan. They're they're pals, and um, okay, yeah, Joe Joe Diaz. You, you can't miss that guy. He is so funny. Now he hasn't produced okay. he hasn't produced a full hour special for a long time. Uh, and I think the last thing I saw him do was only a 20 minute one, but it was, I think mm -hmm. it was the funniest 20 minutes I ever saw. So that's, that's like pushing the boundaries. Also, okay, I'll, I'll try to, how about Brian Reagan? You hear Brian, Brian Reagan? He's, he's super mm -hmm. good. I'm not really like a stand up fan. I'm, I just tend to like Bill Burr. Like I, I think okay. I've watched like everything that he has put out so far. You know that guy's a um, helicopter pilot? Who, who knew Bill Burr was a helicopter pilot? What is up with that? That's so yeah, awesome. Yeah. He has to practice well, in, his auto-rotates. In, in one of his stand-ups, he said it's it's for the zombie apocalypse event. You know, <laughs> Yeah, he'll be the guy who can fly the helicopter. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> he lives in LA and he says like he basically cannot escape because everything would be congested <laughs> to the you know. So I'll just fly a helicopter out of there. Uh, that's that's his point. But I'm, I'm not sure if it's for real. I mean, he he probably just wanted to fly. I think he just rents them. You know, I, I don't think he really owns his own. But <laughs> it's it's pretty no, great. I'm not sure about this. And 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 by the way, just to you viewers out there, I know a little about the, a little bit about this. I, I have some pilot friends, and I intend to get a pilot license eventually. If you want to become a helicopter pilot, get a fixed wing license first. It's required. You have to know how to fly a plane before you can fly a helicopter. It's way more dangerous flying a helicopter. So anyway. one one of my good friends actually, we were friends even before uh, elementary school, so a long time friend. So he wanted to become a pilot because his father is a pilot, like a real pilot on you know serious planes like Boeing seven three seven etc. So. Uh, he wanted, like it was his dream basically, but he wasn't admitted to the school because he was colorblind and it was kind of, kind of sucked. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've had that happen and, to some friends too here in the U.S. actually. Mm -hmm. A potential and FBI. If you know the movie uh, Little Miss Sunshine, there's a, also a character like that. He's like 16 years old or something. He, I think he wants to become a pilot, and then he learns that he's colorblind in the movie. I think and we watched it's that. Very dramatic. I huh? think we posted that on our forums. Actually, you you recommended that to us, and I think we watched it, and then we recommended it. Smashamash.com/forum. In the free. Well, I certainly have not recommended it on your forums. No, you. It was someone else. You didn't recommend it, but the last time we did a video, you recommended it to me, and then we watched it, and then we liked it, and we recommended it on the forums. So it's, Little it's on, Miss Sunshine? I don't think it's, so. It's on there, man. If you go to smashamash.com slash forum in the free-for-all forum, it's not you recommending it. It's me telling people that you recommended it to me. See what I'm saying? Okay. Well, I may have done that <laughs> sometime before. But well, you're, you're going to a gulag now. You're going to the gulag. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I may may actually go. I mean, there are already like twenty thousand people detained in the last. Couple no, seriously of though, like, is, is it like you, you're you're literally in Minsk? You're kind of in the in the in in the thick of it. So, like, what what's yeah. uh, what's what's the deal with that? Are, are are you like, is your do you want to see like, tell us tell us your statement? I don't I don't want to lead you in any direction. What what's going on with that? I I probably know a lot more about it than our viewers do. Uh, well, well, I basically uh, described the situation before the elections in my last video so far uh, on my channel. So if you if you want to learn about it, you, you should watch it. But White Wings that, of Liberty, that one. Yes. yes. All right. Yeah. But after that, there, Please there watch were it. elections which were rigged as everyone expected, and there were huge protests as everyone expected, and these protests pretty much continue to this day. So it's uh, 75th or 76th day of protests uh, already, and like every Sunday there's a huge march of like 100,000 people uh, in Minsk, etc., etc. And um, our government is currently at huge sanctions from everywhere, basically, which is cool because it would fall sooner, etc. And we we are facing a soon economic collapse, like oh, complete collapse of economy. It's 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 actually good because and people actually are expecting this as a good thing because it would destroy the regime faster. So you're like probably like a visionary. Are, you know what's going on. You're you're probably not like a you're not somebody who's really in particular danger. Yeah. Uh, well, everyone is in danger here. Like literally. I mean, uh, I know at least I think five people. Like five of my, you know, uh, accountants were detained at, at some point or, or the other. Is the so, likelihood of Putin showing up in the room you're currently in and clotheslining you out of that chair higher or lower than 5%? Uh, I think it's higher because it's 50% always. So Putin like, might, it, Putin could it's, just it's, bust it's, into the room at any moment. Like Sasha Baron yes, Cohen, yes. and just clothesline you. That would be some shit. That that would this would that would make this channel the most famous channel on YouTube in seconds. I would make a clip let of that. Me, let me explain the the, the, the I would concept. bail you. I, actually, I would bail you out of the gulag. <laughs> you, everybody would be delighted. 
I actually want to make a video about this, about the, the probability and risk. Like it's it's one part of my campaign. That that Putin will clothesline you? I, why are you worried about a pro wrestling match? Logic, thermodynamics, and statistics. So one thing we should oh, not, not understand Putin. is that the probability of um, events in the future is always fifty percent. It's either going to happen or not going to happen. Kind of, yeah. And you cannot possibly estimate the probability like like they tend to do because the I probability that we have currently is taken from the events that are, have already occurred. And from that, you cannot fundamentally infer the probability of future events that haven't yet occurred. So, yeah. Then again, returning to your elections, everyone thought Hillary would win in 2016, and, and I thought that Hillary would win, but... Uh, whatever. What let, do you know? Let me like, just share. Let me the... just share with you and the viewers what it was like. All right, because again, I've never been affiliated with a, a political party, but when I went to sleep that night, I went, "I'm going to wake up and Hillary's going to be president." And I woke up yes. and I realized that by enough of a margin that it was clear that Trump was president. I was like, "What has happened?" I felt like. I didn't feel like Google. I didn't want to cry in the hallways and have human resources meetings and have like have a puppy placed on my lap so I can come to grips with this horrifying reality. Uh, but I was still very surprised. So anyway, it was one of the more interesting elections that I've seen because it was sort of a foregone conclusion that Hillary would win by, would win by a landslide, of course. Mm -hmm. So anyway... Um, this Speaking about elections, and you said that you don't affiliate with any party, but I would still recommend everyone to vote for Joe, Joe, not Biden, but Joe Jorgensen. Joe without E, you know. Who's it? Who's, who's who's Joe Jorgensen? You may know more about American uh, politics she, than I do. Liber she's a Libertarian Party nominee okay. candidate. Uh, I mean, if you just listen to what she's saying, uh, uh, I mean, it makes so much more sense than whatever those two idiots are saying. Please tell me she's so, better than Gary Johnson, because he was terrible. Uh, well, Gary was actually decent. I mean, if you look at what he did as a governor of New Mexico, it's actually oh, kind of cool. I don't know, but he um, he seemed like he couldn't answer simple questions. He he seemed like he could not answer questions as a libertarian, which means it's like, eh, no. I don't know. I haven't seen such occasions. I've seen like people trolling him, and which was kind of funny. About you know, he was asked about Syria, like, "What do you think about Aleppo?" And he says, "What is Aleppo?" And like, <laughs> you know, everyone kind of laughed at it. But it but wasn't just it, it wasn't just that. It was it was other more fundamental stuff about whether or not the government should should run whatever. But you know, it, it could have just been it could have been clickbait. Well, he, Who knows? His, his fundamental point, I mean, he and Bill Well, who was governor of Massachusetts and also was pretty successful there. So their main point was uh, we are socially liberal, which means that we don't mess with your life, right? And we are financially conservative, so we don't mess with your wallet. And basically, that's That's it. a big deal, but man. To, that's a big yeah, deal. Yeah, the, the motto was take the government out of your wallet and out of your bedroom, basically. So you do whatever yes, you want and you, you have your money and we are just going to minimize the government. Um, I mean, that's the only reasonable approach to, to the current society I can see. Uh, and the same goes for Joe. I mean, she says pretty much the same things, but I mean, reformulated slightly, but the principles are the same. Dude, uh, let but me in terms of uh, intellect, like raw intelligence, I would say she is better than Gary. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Joe Biden. I, I, I thought I, I was like, what? No, I thought you were going to no. say Joe Biden and then Joe Rogan was the first thing. I was like, Joe Jorgensen. I seriously don't know anything about it at all. And it's because I'm not paying attention. I, I Well, it's a, it's a problem. But if you look at the recent elections, like in the last, let's say, five libertarian candidates are climbing in terms of uh, percentage like yeah i think yeah. gary gary got something like three percent or maybe even five or i don't remember but was significant you know and in in, in this campaign they may get even more but again the, the whole thing of that she's not admitted to the debates etc is preposterous and 
Um, obviously, you have you know this two-party oligarchy. Uh, yeah, so, pretty much. Uh, and let me just once again, for, you know, for the viewers, uh, when Trump was in the primaries, I was not a fan of Trump. I was stoked that Rand Paul was uh, a possibility for U.S. president. Mm -hmm. You know, the probably the most legit libertarian you could get, but of course he's a Republican because he's trying yes. to be on the major ticket. And then even Ted Cruz, because Ted Cruz is a constitutional conservative and a, and a fiscal conservative. In fact, I was not aware of Ted Cruz until around 2011 or so when he shut the government down because of uh, trying to prevent the, the Affordable Care Act from being passed. He, he stood mm -hmm. there on the Senate floor and he talked for 12 hours nonstop. So, so like, that made, that made some leftist friends unhappy, which caused, which caused my attention to go, oh, why is he making them unhappy? He must be doing something right. And indeed he was. So, and he still is, of course. So, you know, don't forget to follow Ted, Senator Ted Cruz is great. There's a lot of people who are very, very mad at Ted Cruz and... I invite them to not hold a grudge as that would be like ingesting poison and expecting the other person to die. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this year's budget? I mean, would you also have the shutdown as you usually get? I am always in favor. Shutdown? I'm always in favor of the government shutdown if it costs less money. So, you know, every time, every time, uh, the press and everybody is always very worried about, oh, no, the government might shut down. I buy yeah, a pallet I'm... of popcorn and I, I sit there, I call off work and stuff and I stay home and I go, please shut down, please shut down. And if they yes, don't, well, if it doesn't shut down, is... then I feel very sad. But if it does, I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then I go out to the playground and I play on the jungle gym and stuff like that the whole time it's shut down. That's this what is I the answer, like the practical answer to the question: What would happen if we would have no government? Like, would everything crumble? No, no. As you can see, everything is working perfectly fine yeah. without the government. Right. Yeah. It. Yeah. Your your argument for having non-government based funding of everything in the universe is very valid. I just don't know how practical it is yet at this point in human history. Uh, it's not really, it doesn't seem that like the society is going this way. It actually seems like it's going the other way of increasing statism. And again, COVID uh, is a perfect example where, you know, the, the state is just trying to get more and more power. And, and now, effectively, <laughs> there is sort of a conspiracy theory behind this that the COVID is used in order to prevent protests, actually, you know, mass, uh, uh, let's say, gatherings against the government. Yeah, like I, it, it totally is. It 100% is. Because you don't want to kill grandma by going to a protest, because you go to the protest and then get COVID because of asymptomatic transfer, something that's not really... Anyway, we we shouldn't go there on this video. We should we should totally end this. Uh, and, and it started so but, innocent <laughs> with this policy. <laughs> but no, a, a great conversation. It's 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 always fascinating. And I don't know what what the hell are we going to call this video? Terms defined. Whatever we felt like talking about, I guess. Uh, but but it's yeah. Well, it was. It's also, you know, politics is also part of the cosmology because it's part of the cosmos. You know, yeah, I, yeah, systems. exactly. So and it's, it's only fair. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, like, what the hell? My screen sharing stopped working as a result of some kind of failure. That's, that's fine. Anyway, mm -hmm. no, no worries. Microsoft has not interrupted the stream. <laughs> Because it's not streamed, it's being recorded. Maybe so, Bill Gates have vaccinated your computer. Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm I'm, fe I'm feeling a lot better now. Now, you know, I have a weird pinprick in my in my wrist. I don't know where it came from, but I, I'm sure it reminds me of the Pink Pink Floyd song "Comfortably Numb." <laughs> okay, just a little pinprick. There'll be no more. But you make me a little sick. Yeah, you could you could have problems. Anyway, man, uh, we're definitely going to uh, include you on future episodes. Again, uh, viewers, make sure you subscribe to Eugene the Philosopher. Make sure you watch that 
what was that one called? Uh, Boring World? Oh, it's fantastic. Well, that's the one that you're recommending. Yeah, and also the one about, you know, the latest one about Belarus, because there's a, a political revolution going on there because of a, yeah. a weirdo socialist prime minister, is it, or a president? President. Our prime minister basically is powerless. He's doing nothing. I see. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit concerned myself that I haven't done any videos for like two months plus. Uh, but that's exactly because, well, firstly, I thought I'm going to post an update to our situation, like Wings of Liberty Part 2 or something. But then the situation kind of lingered. Then I thought, well, maybe I should make another video about other things. And But the situation here, like you should understand, is very stressed. Like we are under a serious political crisis. And like everyone is is super anxious, uh, so and we're stoked that, to see that you're not in a gulag. That, that you know, I when I joke around about that, I'm not really joking around about that. Your YouTube channel could get you thrown in jail for real. Like I'm not kidding. And and yeah, while while it's I funny to so. quote Seinfeld, it's funny because it's true. And it's gonna be funnier when <laughs> when you're not in a situation like that. We'll be able to look back well, and laugh. I but <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really afraid of going to jail because I know that the regime is going to fall pretty soon, maybe in a few months. So there will be an amnesty and I'll be released. So it's not a big problem. All right. Well, for me, please. I guess that's a that's a weird update that we weren't expecting. But uh, anything else you'd like to add about the discussion? And, and again, don't be a stranger. Of course, you can reach me on Skype anytime, Eugene. Well, the, the one thing I would recommend about cosmology and like electric universe and, and things like that is to read Alvin's books again. They really are very useful because they are very simply written and actually Alvin is a genius in this sense that he writes very simply and very clearly and, and like you just feel such a relief while reading him because everything becomes clearer to you, you know, and so it's, it's very, very cool. So I would recommend that and I'll send you the link to post in the description probably where I uh, like I've read the books and I've pro uh, provided my own synopses of the, of, of these, wow. so you can probably in one hour read more or less the, the most important stuff that Alfin has written. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, right, so I yeah. recommend that. Yeah, by all means, you know, put it in the description or put it on the forum, smashamash.com slash forum in the cosmology mm -hmm. forum. There's a whole lot of information there on various things. We didn't even get to cosmic rays or grand solar minimums or anything like that, but we should uh, maybe postpone that also as uh, the conversation was too interesting to delve into those topics. Let's do it soon. Yeah, okay. But uh, one quick other thing is that Anthony Peratt, he's also, you know, like a renowned plasma scientist and a student of Alfine. But I've started reading his book and I couldn't really continue because it's horrible. To it's got honest. blasphemy? Like, Not blasphemy. No, 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 no. The problem is it is written as a regular textbook, which is horrible. Like, if you compare that to how Alfine writes, it's it's like the oh, sky on earth. I, I, I don't Russian. know. I don't know. I like, Peratt is so much worse at writing than, than Alfie. <laughs> well, you know, be, uh, being, being an interesting writer is a big deal because you have to, yeah. you have to grasp the, the viewer's attention. You know, so if you want to delve into a boring subject, you may have to be uh, extra interesting and have some humor and not be a douche at the, all at the same time. <laughs> you never know. So I would recommend reading Alphine first and foremost. And Perrette, you may actually leave that for, for later when you would I already would, be somewhat experienced in the subject. I would I would That's recommend best. it as well. I... Okay, I think that that's that's it, pretty much. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the latest edition here of Terms Defined. Make sure you subscribe to the playlist, and Eugene's been on other videos, and make sure you subscribe to Eugene the Philosopher. Thanks again, Eugene. Talk to you again soon. Yeah, th thank you, Daniel, for inviting me, and thank you guys for listening in and watching. Goodbye.